Okay, thank you for it. Start over. Uh, Everyone, I just want to say thank you for attending today uh, to say it with the story, capturing anecdotes to drive marketing and promote initiatives. And I mean this in directing those stories we hear while working at the library to our administrators, faculty, and students. I'm Megan Kowalski. I'm the Outreach and Reference Librarian at the University of the District of Columbia. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, if you think I'm familiar, I was previously at Catholic University where I uh, was in roles in both public and technical services. So jumping right into things, stories. People tell us things. We are always hearing stories at the reference desk. Sometimes stories are the best part of working at the reference desk. You never know just you know who's gonna sit down across from you or in this case online and tell you things. And in general, students, faculty and visitors just tell us things related to their research and their personal lives. It's a side effect of what we do. And one of the best pastimes of library work is sharing those stories with our colleagues and others. So what can we do when people tell us things? We can capture their stories to make positive change at our organizations or within our university. And I love this quote from Octavia E. Butler, every story I create creates me. I write to create myself. So why should we capture anecdotes? First, there is power in stories. Humans are storytellers. It's just a part of who we are. We've been telling stories as long as we've lived in groups. And this does go back all the way to the days of the you know, caveman sitting around the fire. We've always told stories in one way or another. Next, stories are emotions in action and emotions matter. You know, There's that clip um, from um, blanking on the name, Stephen Colbert, who used to say, I feel the news to you. And that's actually a truth when we feel things, it makes it matter more to us. And that is because stories are compelling. It allows us to connect with others. Stories are what make things personal to us. So we need to go about capturing those anecdotes that we get. So how do we capture these anecdotes? Well, there are a lot of ways. And first, it's important to note that I heard it at the desk usually doesn't cut it when it comes to trying to do something with stories. You want proof of some kind. So one of the most obvious things you can do is create surveys. And these can be online surveys, paper surveys, suggestion box, any way you can sit, ask people questions and have them give you answers. Or save emails and comments. Um, when it comes to saving emails, you can make a folder and don't be afraid to compile responses and forward them to others. That way you have those stories on file. When it comes to capturing comments, I mean comments that are on blogs, either a library blog, other university blogs, local area blogs, social media, student newspaper, Google News Alerts, basically anywhere people talk, you can capture comments. And an easy way to do this is to either save the URL or use a screen capture and just take a screenshot of that comment that you wanna save. Uh, personally, I love reading the comments on Washington Post stories about UDC. I set up a Google News Alert with all the various ways you could say University of the District of Columbia. And I read the comments whenever we are mentioned in a story, and I have pulled out anecdotes to save to use later. And this is a good way to hear about people who don't actually seek out your library. You are going to them instead of making them come to you. And another way to go and get that feedback from people who don't necessarily seek out the library is to walk around and ask for it by either just doing um, feedback or outreach. And a good way to do this is to go to where the students are or ask them quick follow-ups after you've had an interaction with them at the reference desk or in the classroom. And in this case, snacks always help. An example of this is when I first started my job at UDC, I didn't know what the library's brand was. Our outreach position was brand new and I wasn't quite sure what the story the students had of the library. Did they see us as a helpful place? Were they intimidated by us? Just what was their opinion of the library? So what I did early on was I got a big box of those mixed bag of chips and I walked around the student center and the student lounge area and I asked our students three questions. What do you like about the library? What do you not like about the library? And what does the library need? And some students simply answered those three questions. I gave them a snack, you know, and a quick, you know, sheet about the library while other students gave me more stories and I wrote them down. And I later used that information in a SWOT analysis. Something related to this is you can also record short videos, either in person or ask students to submit them through social media, your website, an email marketing campaign, something like that, with a quick question that they can answer that you can then use later in your marketing. 
Another fun way to do this is with whiteboards, poster boards, post-its, basically an interactive display for students to help provide information to you. And then you can document the response by taking photographs, keeping the paper slips and things like that. This is great for those easy this and that surveys, you know, pick one thing, let us know what you like. So if you're doing a library renovation or you're getting new furniture, you can give students an idea of what they want. Um, it's a low lift for students, particularly if you put it in a high traffic area. A great example of this is um, one that was floating around on Pinterest is they had different levels of furniture, different photos of new furniture set up for their new reading room. And they asked students to put one of those round dot stickers next to the furniture that they would prefer. And then they captured that image and later said, hey, we're gonna go with this one because this is what the students prefer. Another example of this is to have students fill out a note card and pin it to a bulletin board. And this is great for something like, how can the library help you during finals? And that way students give a chance you know, to give you input. And in many of these instances, students also include more information than you ask for. And now you have captured that. So basically when it comes to capturing anecdotes, you wanna do anything to have proof, write it down, record it, photograph it, something like that. So what do you do with these stories? Stories are great and we all have these metrics and data is great, but to use stories and data, you need both to do it well. So why do you wanna capture stories? Well, story brings data alive. Otherwise, data is just numbers. And those numbers don't mean much without emotion. I mean, spreadsheets are boring. And we all deal with them every day. There's nothing exciting about spreadsheets. There's nothing exciting about tally slips. You need stories to actually put those numbers into action. Stories provide context and scale to the data. Stories shape the data in a way that puts everything in context at your organization or for your audience. Stories let you focus in on a small group or expand out to a larger organization, depending on your ultimate goal. And stories are what make data matter because they make it personal. You're showing people why they should care about something. Essentially, stories connect data with people and we care about individuals. So how do you do this? Well, you can let me tell you a story. And then you throw in some numbers. You're crafting a narrative to hook the audience, and then you're putting in data to prove your point. You can also contrast and compare by saying, we are not doing this. They are. Here's the difference. An example of this that gets uh, tossed out in the media a lot is a look at universal free pre-K in various states. You know, states are always telling stories about how kids who have access to free universal pre-K do so much better educationally and long-term outcomes because they have access. And you see the data, but you also get stories if you know that one kid or that one classroom. You can also show a timeline. You know, this was the environment, we did this, and this was the result. It's a good idea to follow a person or a group to show how your initiative impacted people. You can also show the ultimate impact in the results for OER, which is a popular one right now that I will also get to later. You know, you can say we have saved students X dollars, which means they can do Y with their cash. Um, or you can say more students stayed enrolled because they could afford to or had the support they needed. And these are all things that are important that if you just have the data, people will be like, great, those are numbers. Now, what do I do with it? But when you tell a story, you're showing that data in action. And how do you craft this message? In marketing, there's this idea of the marketing funnel. And this usually comes from you know, sales talk, merchandising and things like that, where you're breaking down the customer journey from awareness to purchase. And we can do something similar uh, as a process to funnel our audience to do something we want them to do. So first, you want to define your target audience. Your target audience cares about different things and the way they care about those things is different. Administrators and students, yes, they may all care about the same things, but they may care about them in a different way. And how you speak to students and how you speak to administrators is different. You want your audience to be able to see themselves in the message you're providing. Show them their role in this story. And an important first step of this is you need to know your target audience and what you want them to do before you can craft a successful marketing campaign. Basically, you need to set yourself up for success at the beginning. So once you have your target audience, you can develop your message. And when you're developing the message to send to your target audience, you wanna to stick to one message. You want it to be 
clear, concise, and easily digestible. One sentence or one phrase is enough. Essentially, you're trying to brand the idea or your ultimate goal. And then you want to market that same message over and over and over through multiple channels that target that audience you set up to reach in the beginning. You need to adapt how you share your message depending on your platform. Social media is a lot different than a formal report. And you can use multiple platforms because people, you know, they read different things, they consume different media, you know, and it's also individual preference. Some people hate email, some people hate formal reports, they prefer video. So this is why you need to know your audience ahead of time. Because once you know your audience, you know what they're going to consume and the best way to reach them. And then you need to give your target audience something to do. You need a tangible goal for them to act on. And that first step has to be easy. It's contact us, do this one thing, click this link. You want that first tangible action to not be complicated or hard. The goal is to have them take that first step so that you can hook them for further conversation, follow up or whatever your broader plan is. And the best thing about this funnel is you basically lather, rinse, and repeat it. The basics of this do not change from marketing campaign to marketing campaign, goal to goal. So these steps you just translate depending on what it is you are trying to ultimately do. And so there are some quote unquote dirty secrets of marketing. Um, so you wanna keep these in mind. And one of the big ones is if you're not publishing your results, it doesn't need to be scientific. You're just trying to capture the feelings and stories. So you want to set the stage for the results you'd prefer to have. And yes, this can feel a little bit wrong, but you're not lying if you're upfront about it. And later on, I will explain that. There's this phrase, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can use the data to say what you want. So you might as well go ahead and set the stage to get those stories that you want. And then when it comes to sharing those stories and that data, guilt can be a great motivator or, you know, in academia, it sometimes comes across as peer pressure. People don't want to feel like they're being left behind. But an important thing to remember is you are trying to pull people along instead of pushing them. You're not trying to force someone to do something they don't want to do, or you're not trying to force a group to do something they don't want to do. You want to pull people along and say, hey, join us. This is what we're doing. You think you'll benefit. And that's an important distinction. Also, you want to let your audience fill things in. You don't want to be explicit or you don't need to be explicit. When your audience makes the connection between, you know, your goal and the role they play in it, they more clearly hear that message and they feel it more deeply because they see their part in that. You're trying to create a spark moment where you can grab people's attention and get them to do something. And you can mix and match these secrets. So for example, this is just a basic one. You can say students who had library instruction did 10% better on their next research assignment. And then you would say, hey, we're happy to set up a library instruction session for your class. And then you can add, hey, additionally, in surveys, students with library instruction indicated that they were more comfortable with research after a library instruction session. That's a simple message. Students with library instruction do better. What it implies is that professors who don't sign up for library instruction, not only are missing out, but they're neglecting their student success. And the professor fills in that gap of, oh, I should set up a session. So you're relying you know, on getting the professor to see you know, where they fit, the goal you have in mind, and a little bit of peer pressure by saying, hey, others are doing this, why aren't you? And so one recent marketing campaign we've done at UDC is with OER. UDC is an HBCU and many of our students are non-traditional, so the cost of traditional textbooks can be incredibly burdensome to our students. And we know this. Students tell us this all the time. They come into the library looking for textbooks and we have to say, hey, we can't buy that or, oh, the one copy that's on reserve is being used by someone else. We know this. We're hearing stories over and over again of how expensive the library textbooks are. So how do we go about taking these stories we hear at the desk and showing our faculty why we think they should be adopting more OER for their courses? So our goal was to encourage more faculty to adopt OER, at the very least consider how they could reduce textbook costs. And the problem we had at UDC is faculty see this as a heavy hurdle, a heavy lift that they have to you know, go whole scale into OER and they think that's too much work, I don't have time. And so we wanted to show them that even doing a little bit 
would not only make their courses more um, successful, but more students would be happier by seeing that OER was available to them. And so what we did is we captured anecdotes through a survey. And this was just a basic Google form I put together and then I marketed on our blog, on our social media, pushed it out through an email newsletter, put it on Blackboard, anything I could do to put it in front of students. And because all I wanted to do was capture anecdotes, it was not scientific. I did not capture demographics. I didn't in any way, I wanted it anonymous. I wanted to get those stories. And so these, the survey was designed with questions that would ultimately grab our faculty's attention. And this is because UDC, has a strategic plan called the equity imperative, where at its core, we try to be as affordable as possible to our students. So we wanted to get the data of what our students were doing to afford their course textbooks. I also wanted open-ended questions to capture those stories that wouldn't necessarily come out and saying, hey, did you do X, Y, and Z? And so, yes, it was unscientific, and I was honest about that, but it doesn't matter because it captured the anecdotes and got that story on paper. So what I did is I got those stories of what students did to afford textbooks. And the reason I wanted these is so I could go to the faculty and say, your students are doing the heavy lifting. They're missing bills. They're skipping necessary purchases. They're not seeing family. Can't you do something small? Maybe convert one chapter, one of your three books into OER. And this is the message I wanted to present for its faculty. And so what I did after we had the survey, and this is actually still an active survey because we'd love to capture more of these anecdotes, is I showed the results at our all faculty professional development session last August. All of our faculty are required to do this. So I knew I would get a lot of eyeballs on this data. And so I said up front, I'm using unscientific numbers, but these are things I need you to know. And so I shared a few of the free response stories. And this included things like students saying, I had to drop a course because the textbooks were too expensive. I could not afford to go see my dying father in the hospital because the textbooks were too expensive and I couldn't afford a plane ticket. Things like that. And this reinforced the story that our students were feeling overly burdened by textbook costs. And the number one thing I knew would grab our faculty attention was how many complaints came in that students were paying for these expense, expensive books and then they were not being used at all in the course. And so I leaned on guilt a bit. You know, I said, your students are suffering to afford your materials in a pandemic and you're not even using these books. And so what happened is after this session, many faculty reached out to us to ask about OER and several faculty directly asked, okay, here's my textbook. What options do I have to replace it with? And so now faculty are continuing to ask for support with OER. And since several deans and chairs were also in this professional development, they reinforced that message by saying, hey, reach out to the library. We'd like to go full OER in our department. And so after this session, we've reinforced the OER message through additional marketing, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and I'm on the textbook affordability working group. Their workshops have also helped reinforce this message. So when it comes to doing marketing with anecdotes, things you need to remember are be ready once you start marketing. If you can't handle the work heading your way, change your message. Also, you may get a response you didn't plan on. Um, my OER push had to, you know, another department asking me for a long list of resources on a very short deadline that they wanted for an event. And you know what, that was one of those things where I was like, this was not the outcome I expected, but it's in the same realm. So, okay, we can make this happen. Stories are powerful, but you have to capture them to use them. People like proof. Um, they like to know where you got this information from. And so for me, I could go back and say, would you like to see the results of the survey? Yes, it's unscientific, but here you go. I was able to provide them with a spreadsheet with all of the answers. It's also important to use these because they promote your students' voices. Sometimes students feel powerless on campus. So when you're capturing the anecdotes and then using them to you know, promote effective change, they connect with that. You know, stories, your students' voices can make your initiatives and marketing matter. Universities need students. And so this is an important thing to do because you're saying this is what our students want. This is what our students need. And so you want to create these connections and then reinforce them whenever you can. Follow-up is important. Making it personal is important. And I like to always say nag, but be polite about it. You know, sometimes you just need to be that yappy little dog and be like, I, I don't need much from you, just this one thing. And repeat it over and over again. You know, you don't have to push, again, don't push people, pull them, you know, tell them, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. 
And so I love to provide plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, please put your questions in the chat. I don't know how many people we have on the call, but I would be happy to also uh, hear unmuted questions. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you have about you know, capturing stories or what you found his work at your university. And thank you. <laughs> And if anyone is interested, I do, I can send out, um, here's the presentation. I just dropped that in the chat. Um, it also has my notes so you can see the notes I worked from, but there are also links to the actual survey and then the spreadsheet with the results. And this is an active survey, so we are still getting responses back to it. And I will stop the recording now, but there is plenty of time for questions. Yeah. Are you able to display an example of marketing material when you use stories? So the slides I created for our PD, um, let me pull them 